So I wrote up here on the blackboard uh, uh, the single value decomposition and the expression for the solution because we're going to be using those equations quite a lot so I thought it would be nice to have them, have them right there. Let's look now at some examples of single value decomposition. So, uh, so, so one thing you definitely have to uh, get used to in this course uh, is, is to use regularization tools. Uh, regularization tools was developed many, many years ago on, on a small Macintosh. It was called an SE30. It was a little, a little thingy. Uh, it had a handle on top, so it was kind of portable and an, an, an external keyboard and uh, very, very little memory compared to today's standards. So, so I thought, ah, uh, so, you know, if you use the single value decomposition uh, in, in MATLAB, that function SVD, it, it stores the, uh, at that time, it stored the singular values in a dense matrix with zeros everywhere except on the diagonal. And I thought, no, nah, that's, uh, that's a waste of memory. So I wrote my own version of, of SVD which is called CSVD, Compact Singular Value Decomposition, and then I built uh, regularization tools around that. Right. So, 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 so you have to get used to that. All right. Sorry about that. Uh, so, so everything is, is, is built on the output from, from my version of SVD called CSVD that returns the two orthogonal matrices and then in the middle the a vector with the singular values. I think SVD can do that now, actually. Anyway, that's what you have to do. And uh, so, so those are the helplines from uh, regularization tools for CSVD. And I think the question I get most often when people need help to use uh, regularization tools is, they, is because they use SVD instead of CSVD. So, so you might as well get used to it. Please use uh, CSVD instead of SVD because then everything else should work in, in, in the package. So, yeah. So here are two examples of uh, singular values for two different problems that we looked at last week. Uh, with certainly very different behavior of the singular values. There's a, there's a gravity problem and there's a second derivative problem. The, uh, let's see, the gravity problem has a very smooth um, a kernel function. It's very smooth and many, many uh, derivatives. So we, from the theory, we'd expect that the singular values will actually decay pretty fast. And you can see here, uh, this, this, I discretized the problem uh, into a 64 by 64 matrix. And, and sure enough, you can see singular values decaying there from something of the order maybe 10, between 1 and 10, down to 10 to the minus 16, minus 17, something like that. And, uh, and, 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 and and that's a very distinct and fast decay of the singular values. And then uh, something funny happens towards the end. What's that? Why don't, so in theory, they, I'm, I'm, if you could compute them in infinite precision, they would just keep decaying that. But of course, what you see here is the influence of rounding errors. Here you hit the limit of sort of this, what, you can, what you can compute on the computer. But definitely you can see from this guy here that that matrix is certainly very, very ill-conditioned because the condition number is the ratio between the largest and the smallest singular value. And boy, that is something like 10 to the 18. So that's a humongous condition number. Basically, it's infinite, isn't it? Right. Uh, the other singular values, the, uh, the red diamonds, are for the second derivative problem. And maybe you remember that 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 kernel function there had a discontinuity, uh, so it certainly does not have very many uh, continuous uh, derivatives. 
And, 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 and in respect to these uh, integral equations, that's a nice thing because these singular values decay much, much slower. And again, for this 64 by 64 matrix, you see that the condition number of that guy is maybe uh, 10 to the minus first divided by 10 to the minus five, something like that. So a condition number of, of uh, 10,000. It's, it's, it's not a lot, so uh, definitely. So, so this illustrates uh, at least two things. First of all, it demonstrates that you, know, you can discretize the problem. And sure enough, the singular values of the matrix behave kind of like uh, e expected. And you can also see that depending on the problem you're solving, you can have very, very different behavior of, of the singular values. Now, some, 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 some of you guys, uh, I'm sure, work with, uh, with tomography and the radon transform. And the radon transform behaves a bit like the uh, second derivative there with uh, uh, slowly decaying singular values. Right. And um, here are the singular vectors. And of course, what you do in MATLAB when you, when you plot a vector is that uh, you plot the values of that vector versus the index. So, so, so they look like functions, but they are just vectors plotted. You know what I mean. Right. And, uh, but they suddenly look like smooth uh, functions. And they look like functions that have uh, this oscillation feature that I talked about last week. Right. So showing that this uh, SVD basis is, is really like a spectral basis. Meaning that as you increase the index, of the singular vectors and the singular values, you have more and more oscillations in the singular vectors. What does it mean to have oscillations in a vector? I don't want to give a, a, a very strict definition of that, but, but you, you plot it and you look at it and you see oscillations. Okay, so, so that's basically what I mean here. So these are not, these are neither sines or cosines, but they do have these oscillations. So, so they certainly look like a bit like sines and cosines and have a spectral feature there. And you see, uh, really as expected, that the higher the index, the more oscillations. And remember, higher index is associated with smaller singular values because they are ordered like that. Illustrating once again that higher frequencies are damped more in the mapping from x to the right hand side b or amplified when you compute the solution. Because if you look at that expression here on the blackboard, uh, you see that we divide by singular values. So the smaller the singular values, the more amplification. And uh, the higher the frequency in the, in the u and v vectors. These are the u vectors. The v vectors behave in the same way. I don't show them here. Hmm. <coughs> So, so at this time we can, we can conclude that of course singular value decay to zero. There's no really gap anywhere in the singular value spectrum. They decay fast, sometimes fast, not so fast, but it's not like there's a bunch of big guys and a bunch of small guys. Okay, there's just this decay there. The condition number is, is, is big in most of these problems. We have oscillations in the singular vectors and, and quite often we actually see that the number of sign changes is equal to the index uh, i mi minus 1. So that would be one way of, of counting the, uh, you know, the f defining a frequency. Anyway. All right. So that's what we're going to remember here. Now let's look at Picard plots. Right. What are Picard plots? Well, a Picard plot is... I don't know who came up with that name. I didn't come up with that name, actually, a Picard plot, but everyone calls it a Picard plot. So it's a plot of those important ingredients coming from the uh, singular value decomposition, the ingredients of the expression here on the blackboard for the solution x. Okay, so first thing is, of course, we need to see the singular values and we need to see how fast they decay. So you see, this is, uh, uh, all this is based on the discretization of the gravity test problems and you see this fast decay of singular values until the singular values hit 
something here related to the uh, machine precision, and then they behave a little, and they level off there, right? All right. Then we also need to see the green crosses are the coefficients of the right-hand side in terms of the singular value decomposition. They are in the enumerator here, in the expression for x, so we also need to see those guys. Now, if we were talking about the singular value expansion, then we had this, this thing called the Picard condition. I hope you remember that. The Picard condition said that these uh, right-hand side coefficients must decay faster than the singular values. Okay, so the slope must be more steep for the, the green cross, and that carries over to the uh, singular value decomposition. because there's a, such a close relationship between the two. So sure enough, this is, this is a, a numerical confirmation that the Picard condition really seems to be satisfied, so that's kind of nice. All right, but, man, then something happens here. Here you see this decay that we expected, and then oh, the, something, what is that? What is that? That's something unavoidable on any computer. No matter how good a computer you buy, you have rounding errors. So, so that's the influence of rounding errors. Again, if you had infinite precision, of course these guys would also decay all the way down here, way outside the screen. But here you see the influence of rounding errors on a computer. You can't expect to compute something smaller than that on a computer. This is related to the machine precision, of course. Right. Huh. Anyways, the last thing we want to see is, of course, the ratios between the right-hand side coefficients and the singular values, because those guys are the expansion coefficients for the solution, again, as written here on the blackboard. So, so, so those are really uh, interesting, and that's what you see up here. Right. So, what you see in this range here from the index from, from 1 to maybe around 35, this, again you see a very nice decay. You have decaying uh, right-hand side coefficients. You divide by decaying singular values, but that decay is, uh, is, is not so fast, so you have decaying solution coefficients. So it's all good. And then around index equal to 35, the rounding errors in the right-hand side set in, and we do not have a decay. So actually we have these small numbers that level off at a plateau divided by singular values that, that keep decreasing and then of course you have solution coefficients now that start to increase. And so if you knew nothing about numerical computations, you would probably say, oh, there's some very interesting thing going on with my solution here, but of course it's just rounding errors and and, 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 and what you have out here is just rubbish. It's just all this stuff here is just determined by, by, by rounding errors. It has nothing to do with the problem we want to solve. It only has to do with our computer and define our precision on the computer. <coughs> so, damn it. That's not so good. Because we, 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 we get a lot of junk coefficients here. These coefficients are quite all right. We can trust all those here, but from, from this stage on it's just junk. Yeah, so okay, maybe it's not so important. These coefficients here are small compared to the coefficients up here. These, the largest coefficients of the order maybe 10, and then we have some small coefficients here of the order 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 5, so who cares? Well, damn it, the thing is that these, these junk coefficients, they actually increase, and over here in this range here, they're much larger than, than uh, the good guys. So if you just naively compute a solution here, you will, you will get a, a, a junk solution, an absolutely worthless solution because it's dominating by, 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 by those coefficients over, over here. So, and, and we saw that in the first lecture, of course, if you just write A backslash B, you get something very strange with the lots of oscillations and a huge uh, amplitude and it really doesn't look like any smooth solution you're looking for. So, so that's the explanation, it's just rounding errors. And look at this, this is just a small, this is a tiny system, this is a 64 by 64 matrix. So these, this is not 
problems that arise because I'm solving a humongous linear system of equations where rounding errors accumulate forever. This is just a, a 64 by 64 system, but the, the fundamental problem arises already here for such a small problem, and that is the decay of the singular values and the decay of the right-hand side coefficients. So this, this tells us that the naive solution, A inverse times B or A backslash B in MATLAB, is absolutely worthless. The interesting thing is that it also gives us a, a first hint what we might want to do. Uh, we will return to that many times, but uh, yeah, because these coefficients here, these solution coefficients here in this range here are actually pretty good. We can trust them. They're not influenced by very much by rounding errors. It's these guys over here. So if we want to regularize our problem, if we want to compute an, uh, an approximation, to the solution, we have to do something about the guys over here. These are the, these are the bad guys, and uh, these are the good guys. The good and the bad, and I don't know what's the ugly here. Um, so this gives us a first hint that maybe, maybe if we can somehow get get rid of those coefficients and keep those ones around, maybe we can, we can compute a decent approximation. And, and there's a question. Uh, and the question to what you just said, you said that when you used an A backslash B yeah. to solve such a linear system, then right. you get a graph. Yeah. So because of this, so but would it, why is now the backslash operator connected to the similar value? So, so of course I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm extrapolating uh, maybe a bit here because the, the backslash doesn't no, it's not use the singular value decomposition, it uses an LU factorization. So, so what I want to say with that uh, is that it's still the uh, accumulation of rounding errors that, that hurts the, so the solution no matter if you're using LU factorization or singular value decomposition. And if you go through the uh, the LU factorization, you'll see that, that numbers in the LU factors that we should be small are not as small as they are supposed to be, just like here. Anyway, see, and this was, okay, so there, there's trouble already here, and the trouble is just due to rounding errors. We, we, we're still, in principle, we're just solving a problem where there's no errors in the data. Remember, data is typically our right-hand side. Uh, see, so it only gets worse from here, in a sense. So now let's look at uh, what happens when you have noise in your right-hand side. So now your, your right-hand side is really an ex Let's, let's put a tilde there, because it's the, no, then my, my notation is, uh, let me do this. Okay, so the B here is still the B that I have on my slide over there. Uh, but now B is, is somehow something exact, no rounding errors, no measurement errors, no nothing, just a clean and nice B plus some noise. So how does that noise affect uh, what's going on? Uh, let's see, let's see. First of all, it's the same problem. We have just added noise to the right-hand side. So, of course, nothing happens to the singular values. I hope not. No, oh, definitely not. Because you know what? A perturbation of the right-hand side cannot have any influence on the singular values because they're solidly defined from the matrix. So if they had changed, it was definitely something, something strange going on. All right, so the singular values are, of course, the same. But the right-hand side coefficients, they certainly changed, didn't it? They kind of, um, can you see, they bumped up. The green cross is bumped up from this plateau here, set by rounding errors, now to, to another pl plateau which is much higher. Let's, let's look at what's going on. So, so, so uh, let's get back to the blackboard here. Let's look at those coefficients now. Ui transpose B. So that ui transpose the exact b plus my noise 
And of course, I can just multiply in. That's going to be ui transpose b bar plus ui transpose e. Okay, so those coefficients there, the green crosses, now consist of, 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 of two terms. These two terms here. The first term is actually the coefficients for the true right-hand side. And, and we know, we expect them to decay all the way down to, to machine, well, sorry, all the way down to machine precision. So, we kind of would have, the, 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 those, those coefficients would decay there. And th so what is this? Well, that has got to be the second term. These are the expansion coefficients of the noise uh, in terms of the U vectors. And what you see there is uh, that they level off. The noise I added here was white noise. So that means that all these coefficients there, ui transpose uh, times e, have the same expected value. And so that's why they kind of level off at a, at a certain plateau there. And in fact, the, the size of that level there is about 10 to the minus 7, isn't it? So, so that tells me that I probably added noise of that order of magnitude or uh, noise of the order 10 to the minus 7 right there. Okay. So of course what happens is for the large indices, the first, the first terms in, these, uh, in this expansion here on the blackboard is, uh, is very small and it gets dominated by, by the error term over there. So, so we'll see that very often. We'll, we'll, we'll return to that many, many times. So again, let's see. Let me, let me do that here. Here we have singular. Here we have singular values. Well, those are the red guys. And then we have, um, if we back, back up there and call these the, the green crosses there, I would behave something like it. Now let's, for now, let's ignore the rounding errors. So in principle, they would, they would behave, just decay faster than the singular values. And then we'll have the noise. Uh, see, my noise is going to be purple. So that's going to be something like this. That's going to be my, my noise. And the noise here will manifest, those coefficients will manifest themselves at a certain, at a certain level there, right? Um, so these guys here, hmm, maybe this green color here, okay. So that green color there is now the noisy coefficients, the ones you see on the, uh, on the slide over there, which is the sum of the, the light green and purple. Okay, so when you're in the, in the range here on the left for small indices, you're adding these relatively large green numbers and some pretty small uh, purple numbers. So of course, these two added together, you'll, you'll basically just see, just see this part here. You, you, you can hardly see that you have added something small right there. For the large indices, on the other hand, you have these uh, junk coefficients here coming from the noise plus the light green coefficients that are much smaller. So that means when you're over in this range here, you'll expect the noisy coefficients to basically be equal to the, to the purple ones. And then you'll have a transition region right there. I hope you can see that. We'll see it many times, but this behavior there is exactly what you see in that a uh, numerical example right there. And now you can see more trouble, more trouble in the sense that the solution coefficients, those, those are the blue diamonds, of course, again, from some point, they start to behave uh, in a crazy way. First they, first they decay, that's all nice. But then from here, we have essentially constant values divided by something that keeps decaying, so they will increase, and now they will you know, go all the way up here, out, out of the screen. So that means that we just, you know, the, the problem just got a lot worse by adding noise, and, and this is really not a lot of noise. This was noise of the order 10 to the minus 7, 
I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. You, you're not even able to measure so accurately, but anyway. And, and still, it just means now that there are even more of these SVD coefficients uh, that we cannot trust. Now it's only t about, you know, of the order 20 coefficients that are kind of good and the rest of them are worthless. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And then, of course, what I do in my slides here, I crank up the noise level and, and then, of, of course, things get, just get worse from here. Uh, now the noise level is uh, 10 to the minus 3, and now I zoomed in on just the top part here. So, so again, if, again, if we look at the blackboard here, what, what has changed now when I increase the noise level? Of course, again, nothing happens to the singular values because they come from the matrix. Also, the light green guys here, nothing happens to those because those are the coefficients coming from the exact right-hand side. The only thing that changes is that my vector E here it's now larger numbers, so I move this plateau here. That plateau here moves up because I have larger numbers. So maybe it moves up here. And then, of course, my green curve is going to move up again. And that's, of course, what you see. Now the transition between the decaying numbers the decaying numbers there, and the plateau moved over here to uh, index around uh, 10. Now we only have 10 good SVD guys and the rest of the bad guys. And I could... No, I'm going to stop there. Right, I'm going to stop there. Yeah, um, so what we have learned here, I think we have learned a lot from, these, uh, from this numerical experiment here. Uh, so we have seen the influence of rounding errors and we have seen the influence of, of noise in our data. Typically, the noise, the measurement errors, are much, much larger than the influence of the rounding errors. So you don't have to worry too much about rounding errors. Although it's always an issue and you have to use good algorithms, but the main, the main concern here is really errors. Now in this course we only talk about errors in the, in the data, in the right hand side. But of course in some applications there are also errors uh, in your matrix A and then things just get even more complicated. But we, we do not cover that in this course here. But, but the, the real trouble is those errors in here, errors in the right hand side, they do manifest themselves in this way here. Let me just back up one slide here. Uh, as a perturbation of the solution coefficients. But there's, there's, there's some system to the madness, isn't there? Uh, because we really um, can distinguish, if we look at those solution coefficients, so the blue diamonds, we can see there really are the good guys and the bad guys. And we, we do like the good guys because they are trustworthy. They are coefficients where the, uh, the errors are not dominating, so we kind of like that. We like to keep those around. And then we have the bad guys that try to take over. You know, here, these are the, they, they are try, they're going for world dominance, aren't they? They're trying to take over, so we, get, we have to do something about them. And uh, well, we, so that's, that's what uh, the, the rest of the course is about. That's what regularization is about. You know, doing something about these SVD coefficients here without, without uh, just, uh, doing too much harm uh, uh, to, to the other SVD coefficients. That's what regularization is, is about and uh, from next week uh, we will uh, we'll see that. Okay. So, so that's going to be fun. How, how, do we, how do we actually achieve that? Right. But this is still, this lecture here is still about insight and not so much about regularization methods. Okay, let me skip that slide there. Uh, I just want to 
mention that we have indeed something called the Picard condition. Remember, we had the Picard condition for the singular value expansion. Uh, and we like to be able to say the same thing about the behavior of the SVD quantities. So, so, uh, so we introduce the equivalent here, the discrete Picard condition, which says that these uh, coefficients of the exact right-hand side on the average should decay faster than the singular values. I say on the average, whoops, because you cannot expect that you always have a monotonic behavior. You have monotonic behavior of the singular values because we have sorted them. But you can't expect the solution coefficients to always behave as nice as in this little Mickey Mouse problem. That's, that's the danger of using toy problems. Things look too nice. In practice, you could have uh, the green crosses, they are dancing up and down a little bit, but on the average, they will decay because they have to, and, and their average decay should be faster than the singular values. So that's a discrete. Picard condition. And you know what? It's, it, it's quite easy to eyeball if you do a plot and you look at it. You can see whether it's satisfied or not. Okay. Right. So, uh, right. So what we still need to talk about is the relation, an interesting relationship between the singular value decomposition and the singular value expansion. Okay, let's take a break here. Let's take 10 minutes break here and then we get to that. Oh, that was a question. Let, let's take that question. Uh, so does this So, so yeah, the, que the question here, or the remark, is that, that for real problems, the, the, the discrete Picard condition is never satisfied. And that's actually true. Yeah, yeah, and still we want to uh, uh, solve them. But, you know, here's the thing. Here's the thing. It, it lets us sort of distinguish between the good guys and the bad guys, because the discrete Picard condition is something that should be satisfied for the exact right-hand side, the guy here, the, the, the light green guys, okay, sorry, and of course, so, so the first 20 coefficients, they are dominated by the exact right-hand side, and there you indeed see that they satisfy the discrete Picard condition, so, so we want to use those guys in our solution, and we want to throw the rest away. I hope that was clear. Let's take a break here.